tight budgets as well, and a lot of pressures on their budgets. Uh, and I suppose they sit there and they think, well, you know, we've got to achieve this, we've got to achieve that, you know, we've got to make sure that we get what we are purchasing for. So um, I think we're demonstrating, particularly with some of the response around Whanaora, that actually the DHBs do know how to do this, and a lot of the Whanaora providers would tell you that we're managing to get that to work. I think we're, work I think we're demonstrating it works around the social sector trials that we're running in six communities around New Zealand, about to extend to another 10. So um, it takes a while for them to get it as well, and uh, I think you'll see a continued improvement on it. I know it's a frustration, people mention it with to me as I travel around, but it does take a while for them to get it too. And it, um, we've been banging on at our departments for four and a half years on it, and we just feel as though we're starting to get momentum now. So these things do take a while, but I think, um, I think you'll begin to see more progress. I take on board what you're saying. We talk a lot to them about it. Uh, good morning, Minister. My name's Colin Hayes from Framework uh, Trust in Auckland. Uh, just as another um, small issue uh, regarding contracting, one of the things that we notice is that many of uh, the contracts that we um, have with uh, that are health related are constrained by um, uh, interesting parameters such as um, age limits. Um, and so the, the um, upper age limits, for example, might be um, age 65 uh, with some of our adult services. And, and it can be within mental health that you, um, and, and with today's populations, you often get um, folk that are otherwise um, experiencing um, good health, um, get to the parameter of being outside of the adult mental health um, uh, criteria, and are then advised that they um, should be attending uh, mental health services for older people, which, which broadly speaking, are not covering the the, um, the the range of issues that um, you know, they are often more focused on on more particular areas. So um, I'm wondering, as part of the discussion and contracting, has has the issue of greater flexibility um, for age um, related uh, for for age factors that are non-related um, necessarily to it. it I guess in many cases it would be far simpler and better and, and more consumer focused for um, clients to continue having contact with um, adult services rather than being artificially shifted to um, older person services. Yeah. Look, I know exactly what you're talking about because I've had a number of constituency cases where this has happened where people have sort of got used to one thing and all of a sudden they change age and the whole world has to change for them and all the faces have to change and all the routines have to change. Um, look, I will have to come back to you with an answer on what's happening on that, but you've certainly identified a problem. I suspect a lot of it's got to do with who's funding what, and uh, that's something that we've been working on in terms of what we might be able to devolve to particularly district health boards in order to make some of the things more seamless, but I can't respond to you with anything uh, that we've uh, specifically got in the plans at the moment, but we'll come back to you on that. Questions that Tony's noted he'll come back to you back to you on. Grant will make sure that those questions are logged and that there will be a mechanism for you to get some responses. We have time for two questions in the full group and then you have morning tea time to continue questions of Tony and Joe. So a question here and I think we have one in here. Kia ora Minister, uh, my name is Liz Hurst, I'm a trustee on the Quitline group and I'd like to acknowledge you for prioritising helping people stop smoking, that's great news for us. And I'm aware that Orion has just picked up a contract for the whole of the South Island for a client management system and I'm just wondering, because it would be of interest to our organisation potentially in terms of, is there any tour or a vision for the South Island becoming one DHB? Ultimately, I mean, I'm not talking about tomorrow, but in the long term, is there kind of some vision long term? We've heard Colin James talk about long term trends and visions. Is that any talked about at all? We can't even get bullet and brain out to it. <laughs> um, 
Well, our government doesn't have any plans for that. Look, as I travel around the country, I meet a lot of people who say we should amalgamate DHBs, uh, but not my one. <laughs> That's what they say. So the approach that we've taken, the approach that we've taken really is that um, we'd rather they work together. And so we have been driving quite a, quite a lot of regional cooperation around the provision of services, but also in the provision of back office stuff. So for example, what you're seeing in the South Island is increasing standardisation of the IT systems. So we've got doctors and nurses who split their time between you know, Nelson and Christchurch and Dunedin, and every time they go there, they're working on a completely different system on their, on their patient management and, and recording system. Well, actually, that is a big risk to patient safety. So what our approach is to be is rather than regionalise the structures, and frankly, I don't know whether people even care whether they vote for a DHB person half the time. Most people can't even name them. Um, rather than change, change the structures, uh, we'd rather re uh, regionalise a lot of the back office provision, the IT stuff, for example, like that. So we're beginning a major project across the country to standardise a lot of the purchasing uh, IT systems across the country. A lot of the patient management systems are being standardised. We're trying to standardise um, the records, we're trying to standardise the x-rays and the CT scans so that you can send them from one person to another. We're trying to allow people to go and if they front up at the ED, the ED can dip into their GP record with their permission and the GP can dip into the hospital record with the patient's permission. So we're trying to focus on all the stuff that makes a difference to the consumer and we're less focused on the structures. And that's the drive our government's got, is, is we shouldn't be really worried about what the structures are. It's actually what does the punter notice? And what the punter should notice is that the structures don't matter. Thank you, Tony. Last question for the public full group. Uh, uh, good morning, Minister. Susan Hitchener, Chair of Alzheimer's New Zealand. Gratified indeed to hear your um, observations of the increase in the prevalence of dementia. It is indeed upon us and it's a major issue for us to be considering. I would, however, have a small suggestion in relieving the pressure you envisage for the Associate Minister of Health four years from now with the sleepless nights. And that is um, consistent with earlier comments about the fewer number of measures, the greater the performance, the greater the achievement that the government does give serious consideration and, and indeed make the decision to elevate dementia to one of your health priorities. Yeah. Um, I'd have to say that there are 17 national health priorities already and I bet you no one in this room can name 11. Okay? So I, I'd say I've had a lot of people say to me we need to make things a national priority. Remember rheumatic fever became a national priority in 2001 and there was a big hullabaloo about it, and then nothing happened. So I, I think we should be less focused on what's one of those 17, because no one in this room knows what those 17 are, excepting Mrs. Goodhue, <laughs> who might recite them later. Uh, what I would say is it's actually look at what we're doing as we're, the government is dictating or indicating its priorities in the work that we do. And I've often said to the people, and I know Alzheimer's has talked about this a lot, so as people involved in respiratory, um, I don't think there's that much benefit of being on that list because actually it doesn't have the priority or the prevalence or the importance that some people might ascribe to it. Uh, I think the important thing is to just the actions that the government are taking are far more important. Thank you for working with me, people, around questions. If you have any further questions, you have the morning tea break until 11.05, according to the schedule when we're restarting. On behalf of the group, I'd like to thank you very much, Tony Ryle and also Joe Goodhue, for being here with us. I think it's been particularly worthwhile to be reminded of the government's commitments to the NGO health and disability sector, particularly around working together. So on behalf of the group, thank you very much for being here.